Hi everyone! Um, welcome to this week's uh, lesson um, all about the sun. So uh, up to this point, um, if you've been following along with either the course or these videos, uh, we've talked a lot about the tools that astronomers use um, to study things in space, so particularly light and telescopes. Um, now we're going to start delving into the things that we actually see and start to, to get really into the astronomical stuff. Um, and we're going to use our, our sun as a, you know, good example for what's happening with stars in general, um, or at least as a starting off point, um, because it is so close, we can, uh, study it so, so well. So very quickly glossing over star formation, <laughs> generally, you have a, you know, some ball of gas um, that's usually uh, the gas in between stars called the interstellar medium um, that starts to collapse. Now that perfect little sphere on the left is, is obviously not realistic. This is showing um, from a simulation. Um, and so they start off with something very simple, but you add, you add gravity, you add thermodynamics, you basically add physics to the computer. Um, and run it forward and see what would happen. So the simulation is showing you what would happen over hundreds of millions of years um, to this gas cloud. What you see is that it'll part contract upon itself, but not evenly. There's kind of like clumps and places where it's more dense. Um, so star formation happens in those most densest uh, parts. Uh, if you're playing along with a video game for labs, um, you've seen this in one of the early missions. Um, I think it was in the Orion Nebula. You've seen, um, they showed you these cocoons of gas where baby stars and, and potentially planetary systems were forming. Um, so we see different stages of this uh, actually out there in the galaxy. But like I said, we're glossing over that and getting to the point where the, the sphere that becomes a star, um, you know, in, in these simulations, it would be like, you know, some tiny little thing in one of those clusters. Um, it eventually gets hot enough for there to be nuclear fusion happening in the center of that ball, which by that point we call a protostar. Uh, and once fusion turns on, we call it a star. So the temperature gets hot enough, the pressure gets great enough um, in the core that you get nuclear fusion. And specifically um, for the sun in particular, you get, um, or actually, you know, for, for, um, for stars when they're starting out, you get hydrogen fusion. So you have four hydrogen atoms that fuse together in such a way through one of two longer complicated processes um, to create one helium nucleus. So four protons go in, two protons and two neutrons come out. Um, and there's a tiny, 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 tiny little mass discrepancy. Um, the mass of a helium nucleus is tiny, 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 tiny bit smaller, right? Yes, smaller than the mass of four um, hydrogen nuclei. Now, you've probably learned that mass cannot ever be created or destroyed. That's not entirely true. Uh, it turns out mass and energy um, can be turned into each other. Um, so to make up for that missing mass, that some that tiny bit of missing mass actually gets released as energy or light. Um, so mass itself, you could say, is a form of potential energy. I don't know how entirely correct that is. I kind of like that as a quote. Um, and this goes back to the most famous equation that I'm sure you've heard, E equals MC squared, where energy is the mass times the speed of light squared. The speed of light's a really large number. You square it, you get a really, really large number. Um, and that tells you how the mass and energy are equivalent. Of course, um, that uh, was used to um, create weapons at first, um, obviously nuclear weapons, um, which were fission bombs at first, but uh, hydrogen fusion bombs have been created um, since then, which are even worse, um, because we can't control that process. Um, in the sun, sun is a large, large, large ball of gas, that process can continue and continue and give off lots of light over billions of years. So we say the star turns on when that nuclear fusion starts. Um, and a star is in something we call hydrostatic equilibrium. That means 
it's not expanding and it's not collapsing um, because you've got these balanced forces. The energy provided by fusion, um, it gives you a sort of pressure that pushes outward from the center, whereas all the layers and all the material above the center pulling down on it have um, gravity. And these equal out for the most part in most stars such that they're not expanding or shrinking. Um, and that is true of the sun. And so a star can spend billions of years in this state with a little hydrogen fusion happening in its little core um, and the star staying roughly the same shape. Um, when we look at our sun in particular, uh, going back to the light lesson, uh, I sh think I showed several different views of the sun seen with different types of light. Here's a few more of these. Um, this is from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, uh, which has been, oh wow, has it been 10 years? Sorry, I had to pause to yell at my dog. Um, <laughs> it's about 10 years ago, I think, the uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory is a spacecraft uh, that was launched specifically to study the sun in... Hi, sorry for the interruption, um, although hopefully you can't tell. Um, okay, Sun, Solar Dynamics Observatory. Uh, this is a spacecraft that was launched uh, 10 years ago, and I'm just in a bit of shock thinking of that 10 or 9 or 10 years ago um, because I was at that launch. So it kind of holds a special place in my heart. But it has several different ways of viewing the sun um, in visible light, in ultraviolet light, and in x-ray light. Um, and so, of course, these are uh, colored differently, false colored, you know, x-ray doesn't really have a color, but given different colors for different wavelengths so you can see what's happening in the sun. Um, and so now these different ways of looking at the sun tell us about what's happening in slightly different layers. Um, the layer that creates the light that we see, if you look at the sun safely, not with your eyes or a telescope, um, but with proper equipment that, you know, uh, makes it so that it doesn't hurt your eyes. Um, that surface, surface of the sun, that visible surface of the sun is called the photosphere. Um, and so the picture on the right is showing a visible light image um, of the sun with several interesting sunspots on it. Um, that, uh, that's what you see when you look at the sun in visible light. Um, and also notice it's got a temperature underneath of about 6,000 Kelvin. Think back to the, the lesson on thermal radiation. Um, that is a spectrum that tends to peak in the middle of the visible. So you kind of get all colors, so you get white light. Um, there's a layer just above that called the chromosphere. Um, so that is what's shown here in ultraviolet. I believe should be right. Yeah. Um, and so that is a layer that is actually a bit hotter. Um, it's called the middle layer of the solar atmosphere. Um, so you see when you look at the sun with this type of light, there's a lot more activity that you can see. Um, you can see more uh, of the physics that's happening where those sunspots where you now have a bright region. The corona or outer layer can get to temperatures of a million Kelvin. So super, 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 super duper hot. Uh, so this is, uh, tends to give off x-ray light. Um, so this is looking at uh, the section of the corona um, kind of above the chromosphere um, with the Solar Dynamics Observatory. F the corona extends even further out from the sun such that that's what you can see during a total solar eclipse. Um, so if you were lucky enough to see the total solar eclipse in the United States last time it came through or any other solar eclipse, um, when the moon is blocking the sun, so it's blocking the disk of the sun, which is the main source of light, while the sun's completely blocked, it's actually safe to look with your naked eye very briefly. Um, and you can see the corona is this kind of this ghostly halo uh, around that darkness where the moon's covering the sun. It's super weird and super cool. Definitely highly recommend you seeing that if you can at some point in your life. So all of this material coming off of the sun um, in general is called the solar wind. 
Um, so this is a, a measurement of the speed of the solar wind at different locations around the sun. It's a flow of charged particles. So charged particles means these positive or negative charged um, ions um, that come from the surface of the sun. And these are the things that uh, can actually affect us here on Earth, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so the outer layers are super, super hot, and that's likely due to the way energy is transferred out due to the sun's magnetic field. So you can imagine the sun kind of like a bar magnet. That's what this uh, diagram is showing. Um, where there's a north pole and a south pole just like if you have a regular bar magnet or you can think of the earth's north and south pole um, and the blue and red lines are demonstrating what magnetic field lines might look like um, however that's a lot neater than it really is this is a more realistic view of the magnetic field so the sun's not rotating like a solid body like the earth is a rock that rotates for the most part um, some parts of it rotate faster than others and so you've got material pulling around in a non-solid way and it twists those magnetic fields so it's actually way more complicated um, those twists can cause activity um, such as things like solar flares um, so these are this is showing a couple of solar flares that uh, oh there it is that little jet at the top there um so that's spewing off material from is from a, a location of a solar flare because we see it being spewed off to the side it's not directed at earth um, if that is directed at earth you have a lot of charged particles coming towards the earth very quickly um, so this solar activity um, looks different at different wavelengths like i mentioned before um, in the photosphere it's going to show up as dark spots uh, it's going to show up bright in ultraviolet and x-ray and in this very lovely artist conception of the Sun-Earth system, um, we have to be aware of these solar flares, um, these uh, events called coronal mass ejections, because that those particles could do damage to Earth now, or, or us, or in particular our technology. Um, the Earth is protected by its own magnetic field. That's what those ghostly blue lines around the Earth on the right are, are representing, um, which deflects a lot of it, but a strong enough uh, event uh, could overwhelm that and sneak through. Um, if you're doing the reading along with this course, I think they talk about a, a blackout that happened, um, I wanna say in the 80s. Um, the, uh, where a particularly strong event caused uh, trouble in a power grid. You could also have interference with satellites, which we rely on more and more. Um, so this is an actual danger and something to be aware of. And one of the key reasons um, why studying the sun is very, very important for maintaining life on Earth. So this is not just a, ooh, this is cool astronomy. This is one of those things in astronomy that can directly affect life on Earth in negative ways. However, for all I say about it being a danger, um, we would not have life on Earth without the sun. Um, it would be impossible. So most of the energy used by living things uh, comes from, ultimately comes from sunlight. Um, there are a few microbes that get energy from other sources, but most life on Earth relies on sunlight the energy from sunlight being trapped by photosynthesis, by plants and other um, other living things that use photosynthesis. And then, you know, well, actually look over on the right. So you've got your, your well, I guess they just call it green plants, but your producers. Um, and then you've got your primary consumers. So you've got, uh, let's say, got a caterpillar and a, and a cow, things that eat those plants and get the energy from that. And then you've got consumers, uh, secondary consumers or your predators. Um, those are the things that eat the animals that ate the plants. Um, most humans, many humans are omnivores, right? Uh, a lot of us eat uh, animals as well as plants, so you're getting both. Um, all of that starts with energy from the sun. So we need that energy for life. Also, as the picture on the left is showing, uh, we need the heat and light of the sun to keep the earth from being a frozen ice ball. Um, so this is, this is demonstrating the greenhouse effect um, where the uh, visible sunlight comes through the atmosphere 
and then green uh the earth reflect uh, not reflects re-emit some of that back as infrared light um, but the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere such as water and carbon dioxide a little bit of methane in there um, will kind of trap and re-radiate that back down which warms the surface um, and without any greenhouse effect uh, the earth would be an ice ball and life would be impossible um, so greenhouse effect all the, for all the bad rap it gets um, with climate change uh, and the way that it's changing so rapidly now, uh, no greenhouse effect would be disastrous. Okay, so to highlight, um, the sun is our closest star, allows us to understand the fundamental properties of all stars, um, figured out nuclear fusion and all that fun stuff um, by studying the sun. Nuclear fusion in the core produces the sun's energy, which is vital to life on Earth. Uh, and also going to be the source of energy in the cores of many of the stars we're going to be looking at um, coming after this. And all that solar activity needs to be monitored um, as these flares and coronal mass ejections can interfere, particularly with our technology on Earth um, and our electronic systems. So we don't want to lose our whole power grid to, to something like that. All right, I will see you for the next lesson.